we're back for section 9 where we're going to have a look at coordinate systems and how to convert from one coordinate system to the other. For example, the ukulele coordinate system to the whiteboard coordinate system. I must warn you that the ukulele is starting to have its own will and sometimes it may appear in very weird places. Coordinate systems are incredibly important in both maths and physics. And first, we're going to have a look into coordinate systems to describe 2D spaces. We can briefly split them, split the world, into coordinate systems that are Cartesian and the other types of coordinates that are polar. The big difference is that in Cartesian you're very aware of the fact that we would represent every point by a combination of x and y and that we would label the horizontal axis as x, the vertical axis as y and a specific point, say this one, would be given by x and y coordinates. In Cartesian 2D systems, we look at the distance from the center in both x and y, and we have a unique way to identify a point. Polar coordinates are different. Just like here, there is a 0, 0. Polar coordinates also have an origin. This is the origin of both coordinate systems. The big difference is that in polar coordinates, what you have is a polar axis, essentially something looking like this. And the way that you describe this specific point here is by using an angle and a distance, r. How does this work? If you are to compare it with Cartesian coordinates, we can draw it like this. This would be the y-axis and the x-axis. I'm doing it just so it's easier to define what we mean by theta. And this is typically the angle that we define. So we start counting from the corresponding x-axis in Cartesian. We move this way when theta is positive and we move the other direction when theta is negative. And the way we process polar coordinates is first we move the polar axis and then we move it from the origin until the point by essentially moving by a distance r. It's relatively straightforward, but it is a very different way to identify points. And there's a very big difference with the exception of the origin for which you only have a combination for all of the points in polar coordinates. You can always go back to the point for example, by adding 2 pi, or you can add pi, you go to the other side, and then you multiply r by minus 1. What does this imply? It implies that in polar coordinates, a point can be given with literally an infinite number of combinations of theta and r, and also that we really need to be careful about when we convert things from Cartesian to polar. There's only one way to write down a point in Cartesian. There's only one x and y that describes this point, but there are many combinations of theta and r that describe exactly the same point. One important question that you can ask is, isn't there a way for us to normalize the polar coordinates? Essentially just say that theta is only allowed to go maybe from minus pi to plus pi? I mean, wouldn't it make it easier? Maybe we should be saying, okay, and also we're physicists, so we only care about r higher than zero. This is certainly possible, and in many cases you'd be told, find a solution considering this. But as far as polar coordinates are concerned, there are no constraints. This means that r can definitely be lower than zero, and there is really no constraint on theta. Theta can be whatever you want from negative to positive values. And as we'll see in some examples, whenever you convert from polar coordinates to Cartesian, you need to be careful because of that, of the combinations. 
there are infinite combinations, but R and theta are always linked. So you can't just add pi or 2 pi without thinking about what you're also doing to R. But we're going to get to that specifically when we look at coordinate transformations, which is the next video. As soon as I find my ukulele. You haven't seen it around in the video, have you?